hello good evening and welcome to row to 2023 on symphony it's a friday edition of the program and it's been a rainy day at the nation's capital here in abuja nigeria don't know what the situation is where you are but for us here life must go on the rain for some of us is showers of bless i am victor he really welcoming you to the program on today's edition. And uh, tonight, a few days ago, former president, good luck, Ebele Jonathan, during the 70th birthday of Bishop Matthew Kuka, did say that uh, Nigeria was gradually sliding towards dictatorship. And uh, this was of concern to a lot of Nigerians who have been wondering developments in the last couple of years. Uh, for some, there is nothing wrong, everything is normal. But for others, this is a time for us to reflect, especially as we head towards 2023 elections. Now is the time for us once again to do the usual four-year ritual. But unlike before, where the issues had always been, there are no options. It's a case of uh, having too many people around and then nobody around. But this time around, we have options by every standard, by every stretch of imagination, whether by age, whether by youthfulness, whether by accomplishment, whether by results in their individual lives and capacity, we have them to make a choice. And of course, they come in different shades and colors. So all you need to do, use your power, the PVC very well, and effect the change of the direction you want Nigeria to go come 2023. I'm not alone on the program tonight. I'm being joined this night by a former minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, former minister of sports, and who is are you to return to the National Assembly to join them in making laws for the country? They will be seeking to represent the good people of Lantang North and South Federal constituency on the platform of the Social Democratic Party. Honorable Solomon Dalong is my guest on the program this evening. Mr. Minister, good to have you. Thank you very much for this. Uh, opportunity to join you in discussing national issues. Thank you very much. Of course, do remember to like, share, comment, subscribe to Symphony. Also don't forget to hit the notification bell. We'll be having some of our friends join us online. As they do, we will acknowledge them and uh, hope to hear from them. You are free to send your messages or call with the link that has been provided for you to join us on the program. We go on a short break, and when we return, we'll hit the ground running on the program. His Excellency, Dr. Goodluck Jonathan. are living in a dysfunctional society and you are a clergyman you can't keep quiet in fact father cooker asks whether he bruised uh, bru me too <laughs> but see, the society we are managing is quite complex yes i was the president i tried my best but it does not mean that we had no issues now we are talking about asu strike during my time too asu had four months of strike. Different committees were meeting and meeting and nothing was working. And I said, how can our students stay out of school for four good months? I had to call a meeting of all the leadership of ASHU. I presided over the meeting with my vice president. The attorney general was there. I said that night we must solve that problem. Attorney General was there, 
Secretary of Government was there, the ministers of education were there, the labor ministers were there, the finance ministers were everybody that has to do with. And I thought that my being there will help us to do things quickly. But we spent the whole night, before we finished at like 5.30 a.m., before we concluded, and the strike was called off. So there were issues. Sarah, Honorable Minister, we we'll, we'll just have to start from education. So the former president of Jonathan made reference to that, uh, talking about uh, ASU strike. It's been one strike too many. This is uh, about uh, 201 or 202 days of this strike still counting. There seems to be no end in sight. And therefore, uh, some persons, just like he gave the example, the strike has gone beyond the ministers. Now, the highest uh, organ should take over if we really like education and want to move forward as a nation. Well, um, <clears throat> painfully, the strike is here with us and is lingering, just like you said, still counting. Unfortunately, I think. Um, this issue shouldn't have been in the first place. The strike started during the military, Babangida's uh, era. Myself were the victims of ASU strike, were the casualties, because I spent nine years studying law instead of five years. I had a donation of four years from ASU strike. But while this was on, in our about second year, Abacha dealt with the issue. Because when ASU approached Abacha, he invited them, just like you said, he invited them as a president and said, what was the problem? And they said, well, we are talking about funding of education. Our standard of education was going down. Of course, it has gone down below what it was then. And Abaja said he has no money to give them, and they said, no. We are not asking you to give us money from our budget. We know where we can get money. So Abaja was so excited because it was a relief. You know where he said yes. Where will you get it? As you said, well, we are going to get 10% from the uh, profit margin of um, companies doing businesses in Nigeria. But they said, go and draft the decree. As you went and drafted the decree, they brought, he signed because he felt they have taken the burden off him. And that's who left. Nobody believed that that education trust fund was going to generate a dime. Even the military did not believe. But in six months, 75 billion accrued in the account. And the federal government invited the decree back and amended it. Because the initial decree had a board of trustees and everything that was to accrue was to go on education. But when they discovered that much accrued within a short span of time, the decree, the decree was amended to include the interest of government. So government was also a beneficiary of that money. To cut this long story short, as it is today, the decree which later became an act of the National Assembly on the third democracy, had been mutilated to the extent that even us who do not have representatives on the board again, because the initial decree said the executive secretary of the board should be an academician. Today, the executive secretary of Ted Fund is a retired pamphlet of Ministry of Education 
who was taken back to take over. So, you are killing the goose that lay the golden eggs. And therefore, the money meant now for the funding of education is now being used to service political interest, relationship, nepotism, and campaign. And the purpose for which it was established is completely defeated. That is in itself theft of intellectual property. Those who came with the idea, the idea had been taken over by a different set of people, and they are busy vandalizing the resources while neglecting education. The issue of ASU strike is not about welfare of the university lecturers only. In fact, the major case of ASU is about the funding of university education, provision of infrastructure, provision of uh, uh, instructional materials, uh, uh, equipment in the labs for training of students. These things are not there. I was a university lecturer before I joined politics. When I was lecturing, my class used to have about 350 students. And you have the, 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 the initial classroom is 114 students. So the over 200 plus will hang on the windows, sit on blocks. In fact, you have your students competing with you on the platform where you stand as a lecturer to sit, to listen to lectures. I used to head female students wearing jeans and coming to my class. I used to send them out. But one day I called one lady. I wanted to send her out. And she said, sir, can I explain myself? I said, do, do you need to do it openly or privately? She said, privately. And I went with her by the side. And she said, sir, we come here and sit on the platform facing men, male students. Now, if we are sitting wearing skirts, it is very, very uncomfortable and is inconveniencing us. So when we wear jeans, we feel freely. From that day, I changed my mind and allowed them to wear jeans to the class. This is the situation that ASU is trying to address. Phone education properly, build infrastructure to accommodate the rising number of students. So it's not an issue of ASU being selfish, ASU, ASU being insensitive. No. The lecturers that are still in the university today are patriots who love Nigeria. Majority of them had left the country to greener pasture. But these ones that are here are the ones that have vowed to ensure that when they went to the university, they were fed free, they didn't pay school fees, they were dry cleaning their things, government was doing everything for them. So they lacked the moral high grounds to abandon this system which created them to go elsewhere. So today, they are criminals. Government is blackmailing them and Nigerians are gradually trying to buy the blackmail. I think the, what will end as a strike is for the president of Nigeria to invite us members of the National Assembly, let them bring the Third Phone Act and return it to its original content of the Education Trust Fund and appoint credible Nigerians to take over the, the phone. It should be removed from the Ministry of Education and the minister should have nothing to do with it. It should be managed by credible, reputable, and trusted Nigerians as trustees of the fund and let them develop and fund education. All right. Just to acknowledge that uh, James has joined us from the Gambia. James, good to have you. Yeah, thank you so much indeed. Thank you. All right. Paul Iwunze has also joined us from the US. Paul, good to have you. And then Ifani has also joined us from Indonesia. Ifani, good to have you. 
Yeah, good morning, sir, and a happy weekend. All right, thank you very much. Okay, all of a minute, let's move ahead on the program. Uh, yesterday, it was for a lot of persons, their mental health, we are, we are really troubled. When uh, the Controller General of uh, Customs, Hamid Ali retired, Colonel Hamid Ali retired, appeared before the House Committee uh, dealing with the medium term expenditure framework. And uh, the issue of that Nigeria has a budget, proposed budget next year of 19.76 trillion naira. And out of that amount, deficit will be between 11.3 to 12.4 trillion naira. They ask him, why is it that we are not generating enough fund? And then we have a situation where NNPC says we consume 98 million liters of fuel every day. And he said it's not possible. That to start with, NNPC before now, we are told Nigeria consumes 60 million liters which he even questions. And then it has now grown to six million naira as subsidy. He said, the difference, that's 38 million, why should NMPC be still importing this thing? And even if we want to believe, scientifically, can they prove that 38 million liters leave Nigeria every day? He asked, how many trucks carry this thing on a daily basis? And where do they pass through that we don't see? For you, the issue of a subsidy and the how much uh, how much fuel we consume on a daily basis. Does it bother you? Do you think the figures we have are realistically true? Well, thank God while coming here, I have to take my PP pills because I anticipated um, issues like this will come up so that I don't um, collapse. Um, every day of my life, when I hear things like this, either been discussed in the media or mentioned, uh, my body temperature escalates. Well, let me begin by saying that, you see, Nigeria is on oxygen. And um, when you go to the hospital to visit a patient who is on oxygen, you don't go there to be discussing the hospital bills and how much was spent on the person. Because you will easily send the person to his grave. So all these discussions about Nigeria, with raising of figures, whether so uh, how many liters or metric tons of all these things are just fabrication of people who are neck deep in looting the economy of this country and they, they, are, they, they are also clueless. They don't, they don't know what to do. They've stolen so much, they don't know what to do with the money. They don't know how to explain it. They don't know how to even talk about the country. So each time you call them, they come up with some figures they cannot defend. But let me build a foundation to what uh, Amin Ali said. Is it the 11.4 trillion they are referring to? Is the report of Ahmed Joda Transition Committee that uh, they are now bringing it back. And I was a member of that committee. Uh, when we took over, after about 40 days of intensive hard work, we realized that Buhari's government in 2015 will need 11.4 or 5 trillion to form government. Uh, and, and, and then that, when we gave the president the report, the president was completely devastated. Now, the president had came out of that because in government, we were able to stabilize Nigeria in 2016. We moved Nigeria out of recession. And by the time I left the cabinet, we have made 2.71% 
economic growth from the session. So Nigeria was stable when we left in 2019. The, our economy was stable and revenue generation was on the increase. So Nigeria has no problem to get to where it is today. But from 2019 to now, there have been massive looting going on in the government. People that were standing trial or being investigated later became born again Democrats, joined the APC, and were appointed ministers. In fact, the Minister of State Finance was one of the persons being inve investigated by Magu for subsidy racketeering in the past administration. He is now comfortably sitting as a Minister of State Finance. How can we have money to run government? Everything there is being diverted now to cover up loopholes of what they have looted in the past and they were standing trial. So you have the recycling of the wealth of the country within uh, a crime scene scenario in the system of government by those involved. So let me be very honest with you. The issue of these figures, they are rolling out. The country is on autopilot. Whether it will land successfully or it will crash, nobody knows. There is indeed the absence of leadership. The absence of leadership. If the president, Mahmoud Buhari, was in charge and in control of the country, these issues would have been something he should have tackled. But the president himself is not informed as to what is happening. The last time I went to see the president, after reviewing the security situation, the economic situation, the president was a stranger to what I told him. He never knew that bandit has taken over so many places in the north. He never knew at that time that traveling from Abuja to Kaduna was high risk. He never knew that they were kidnapping people. I even told him how my cousin's daughter was kidnapped in Joss and he was sympathizing with me. That is a man that is commander-in-chief who has a finger on the nuclear bottom of Nigeria. So if the president is not properly briefed, as he even indicated during the Kuje Correctional Facility attack, when he said he was disappointed, there was no single intelligence before the president, yet other members of the intelligence community claim or came out to say 40 security reports were torn in, but they could not get to the president. And the president said, I was disappointed in the intelligence system, yet no head role. The same people who disappointed him are there. The same people who have been collecting billions for security are there. They, do not, they don't turn in a security report to him. He is disappointed in them. He is keeping them either to work for Nigerians or are they working for the bandits or terrorists. So this issue of looking for 11.4 trillion is just a ploy to take back the Ahmed Jodas report, which has the same amount of money that was needed in 2015 to run government, to now turn it in and mislead Nigeria that, oh, we have gotten to a terrible economic situation. Meanwhile, theft of the national revenue is going in at all levels. Even the Ahmed, the Colonel Ali, who raised that issue, was he able to account for how Abuja 
between 2019 and now being converted into Kastan. There is no single space now in Abuja except Kastan. Those vehicles came through where? If they collected revenue on those vehicles, will Nigeria still be talking about uh, money? And in any case, bringing those type of vehicles that Abuja has been taken over everywhere now is Kastan. Do we have the roads for those vehicles? So I think this thing they are saying is because people have not died of hunger, they have not died in the hand of bandits, they have not died in the hands of violent criminals or terrorists, they want the older generations to go to their grave because of these figures they are rolling. But I think these figures are nothing but the conspiracy of a criminal gang that has anchored itself within the system, looting with impunity and taking advantage of the fact that the president is also, you know, the, the president of Nigeria is also a victim of political bandits who have kidnapped him and uh, they are detaining him with the Nasoro. Because nobody sees the president. They choose who to see the president. They choose to, uh, the type of information the president gets. They even choose the security report to get to the president because the president has confirmed publicly. So I think that we must treat these figures with very high suspicion. It is just what we can call a bracada, a bracada of people who lack the sense, who lack the ingenuity, the capacity, the competence to navigate a country. So a bad workman blame his uh, tools, even not in one single transaction. In one single transaction, an accountant general stole 109 billion. And when they took him to court, he was smiling. It was a mockery of the judicial process. One transaction. We have not heard of other transactions. And he got bail. He got bail. They are even talking of a, a plea again. When he will come back and say, okay, plea again, he's bringing 20 billion. And he will be let off the hook. So that type of system can always be rolling figures like this. So the figures should have not come from Colonel Amit Ali, who has a lot of questions to answer, to answer about his role in revenue being generated in this country, being the control general of cost. Next year, we are being meant to understand that we are likely to borrow between 11 to 12 trillion naira. Do you think Nigeria seriously needs to be in the level of borrowing that we are right now? Our our public debt stock is about 41 trillion naira this year. That is based on even the first quarter release of uh, debt management office. Maybe by the end of the year, we might get to 50. But do you think Nigeria should be at the level of debt and this joy that we derive in borrowing now borrowing for what before i left the cabinet in 2019 sometimes around april of 2019 well in one of our federal executive council meetings i raised an observation and i asked the president that for about four years now we sit here every wednesday to approve billions of naira for power works and housing. Millions of dollars for power works and housing. And four years, about four years into our tenure, the government has not been able to commission a 10 kilometer road. And I told the president that as a minister of youth and sports, 
I initiated projects in 2016 and commissioned them in 2019. And these were projects of less than 500 million. So why was it impossible for this ministry that we have sunk trillions, yet we cannot commission 10 kilometer road? And as at today, I stand to be corrected. The Ministry of Works and Housing now, which was Power, Works and Housing, has not been able to commission 10 kilometer road in Nigeria. The one they commissioned in Ogun was a private uh, sector initiative, PPP, which was initiated by an individual and not government. So what has become of the trillions appropriated to the Ministry of Power, Works, and Housing. Tra go and travel on our roads. There is nowhere you can find any good road, maybe except in Abuja, and maybe the one that is taking over a decade to complete, the Lagos Ibadan. Now, so these monies that we have been borrowing, we borrowed them for what? The railways which Amechi was shouting left, right, and center, collecting trillions or billions of dollars from China. Where are the railways? I was in cabinet. Amechi announced to us that by 2018 September, rail, railway train will move from Kano to Lagos. Till then, we have not gotten to September 2018, till then. Because there is no single train that has even passed it. So, where are all these monies that we collected from China for building infrastructure? Do we collect money only to commission or oh, to just go and launch projects and that will be all because all these monies that we have been collecting there is no single project to justify it we approved the contract of dual carriage from uh akwanga to just to bauchi Gombe and Adama till then work is still at the level of mobilization of the contractor. Yet a lot of money every year in, year out is approved. So this will take us to the question of okay, why must we collect loan again after the tune of 11 trillion in the terminal days of the government? What do we need that money for? And if the National Assembly, which always approve these loans with fear, sometimes wants the letter, said, we have a letter from Mr. President. The letter is requesting the National Assembly to approve the mentioning of loan. The National Assembly will say, the eyes have it. Approved. How can National Assembly discuss long the future of this country without referring it to public hearing for Nigerians to come and participate? Let us go there and agree that we are going to enslave our great-grandchildren. But the mentioning this 10th Assembly the mentioning of loan once they hear L O A N, the eyes have had it, had it. It will not be discussed the principles of the loan, the merit and the demerit of it. No, the eyes will have it. So, if the president is going to write a letter requesting for 11.4 trillion, and I will just have to fast and pray. Because before the letter will be written, it may be 
around 15 to 20 trillion. And should that letter arrive in the National Assembly, I am assuring you the eyes of it. So we are facing a terrible situation that we never in the history of this country ever had it. But this government has no moral justification. They have no legal justification to collect a dime. Rather, this National Assembly should be interrogating all that they have collected and discharging their oversight function to compare and see whether the monies collected had been judiciously spent on the project. Otherwise, I don't see any reason why this government will even ask for a loan of pure water. They have collected enough and they are yet to account for it. Tech security. The trillions pump into security in Nigeria. Yet if you see the equipment, the equipment they kept telling us, the military will even come out and lie. And I know that the military is a national. It's a national institution that should defend the interests of the country. But they will come up and lie, oh, this has been put, we have purchased this equipment for us they have done this yet if they come out to now on the theater the type of equipment you see there were the ones used during the second world war the armored vehicles the, even the guns the ak-47 is the first version of ak-47 used during the Second World War. It's not the Assembly carry. The one's police carry and police is older than the policeman. And if you see bandits, they carry brand new weapons. Yet this same set will wear uniform with the ranks of the Nigerian army sit down to tell Nigerians lie. So where is the concept officer and gentleman? Was a military officer, it's a gentleman. He represents the country and he must be honest in anything he said. All right. Uh, whatever, Mr. We we'll just have to allow our friends who have joined us online, I'm sure they've been re listening with rapt attention, to just uh, weigh in on uh, some of the issues we've discussed. We've not gone to the main topic i hope uh, i want to give you people an opportunity in case you may want to have a question for the honorable minister or comments or reactions uh you are free to do that i will start with james but just uh, have it at the back of your mind please we will be going to the main topic so we don't finish our time on this so maybe let's say three three minutes will do for us for now as opening statement James, let's start with you. Mr. Solomon, we thank him for coming. Uh, it is never too late to, um, <laughs> it's difficult to say what, 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 anyway, thank you very much for coming and divulging these uh, useful pieces of uh, information, some of which we already know. Um, although you did not mention these things while you were in government, but as I've said earlier on, it is never too late. We thank you so much. Um, let me start from, you made mention of uh, Nigerians going out for greener pasture. In the first place, there are no pastures in Nigeria. I left Nigeria, immediately I left the University of Lagos when I completed the second degree program. That was during Sagari's administration. I hope you are hearing me, the line is not clear. I'm, I'm together with you. Good. Now, I left Nigeria during Shagari's administration when I completed a program at the University of Lagos. I could not even get a job with a master's degree to teach in a primary school. That was during Shehu Shagari's administration. That was when I worked outside the country. In the first place, there are no, green, there, there are no pastures in Nigeria, let alone green.
greener or whatever color we want to you know attach to it okay now um an irresponsible government cannot negotiate responsibly so this is a problem they just have to suspend it till some other time let the strike continue well so has already preferred a solution you should go back to him and hear what he has got to say prefer the solution during babangida's time now the issue of oil subsidy uh, the, uh, it's true they are importing oil to Nigeria, petroleum to Nigeria. Some time ago, I had the advantage of traveling by road from Dakar, Senegal to Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, all the way from Republic of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, what's it called, uh, Republic of Benin. Anywhere you go, you see Nigerian petrol along the road. In fact, those countries, they don't even have petrol stations. Let me put it that way because we never branch any petrol stations. They buy petrol from along the roadside. All these things are small gold petrol off in Nigeria. So it is true we are importing petrol and petrol. Now, um, there's colossal theft taking place in Nigeria. This reminds me of what happened in Ghana. I can't remember the head of state then. When a shipload of cocoa got lost on its way to international market or so, but the sailors, they all returned. The crew, the captain, everybody returned, but the ship was missing. <laughs> Eventually, in the year 1979 or thereabout, generalists took over the government. It was an unmitigated disaster. Africa, Kufu, Achampong, retired sense of states were shot dead at Teshi Fari Range. In Liberia, during the time of Samuel Do, that man corrected an I mean, a 158 year of injustice in Liberia. And at the end of it, 15 top ranking government officials were executed at Atobakle Fire Range on the beach of Monrovia, I think April 15, 1980. That was in Liberia. So, whosoever commits atrocities against Nigeria must be held accountable. Any future government that is not holding them accountable can be treated as a culprit to the crimes they are committing. If you are the commander in chief of the armed forces, the box stopped on your table. Guja prison was attacked, nothing happened. The Jay Republic, which is your I mean, well, ancestral home, is treated as a state in Nigeria. They even get more than, anyway, I think my time is running out. They even get more than what we are getting in Nigeria. Buhari is a pretender. They should tell us what the grand agenda is. And lastly, I walked out of Nigeria because of injustice. When I completed my master's degree program, I went to the University of Sokoto for an interview. I was interviewed by a Ghanaian who was the head of the department. They call him L.A. Day. After the interview, I was moving from Benin to Sokoto, Benin to Sokoto, following the development of the interview. But at the end of the day, and how some man called me aside and told me, young man, I'm sorry, we cannot give you this job because you were born in Ondo State. Why not look for a job elsewhere? Well? If a Ghanaian can come and head a department in a Nigerian university, and that same university is telling me that I was born in Ondo State, I cannot work in Sokoto, to hell with Nigeria. I'm a Nigeria parent. Okay, uh, James, uh, I had expected that uh, after yesterday you will, you will just be coming down, as we say in Nigeria, be coming down, no matter what it is. All right, because you mean well for Nigeria, that's why you join us on this program. So I, I hope you just uh, continue to wish Nigeria well. Paul Iwunze, let's hear from you, Paul. Victor and uh, good evening to Honorable uh, Minister. Um, good evening. So, yes, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, listening to you uh, at uh, IBD program the other day when you were speaking about education, I think uh, I enjoyed you speaking because you were saying the truth, Mr. Victor, I told you. And uh, even listening to you again today here, uh, like uh, James said uh, uh, when he was starting, you made mention of a lot of things that we, if myself, let me say not we, because others might know, but I didn't know. So I want to thank you uh, for that. And uh, 
you know, I, I, I always say that our leaders, they, they know what is right, they say what is right, but one begins to wonder why they don't do what is right. Uh, I, I don't know why. But uh, if I may ask the Honorable Minister, um, the borrowing that they're doing in their country, it's obvious that they don't use it for anything. They don't invest it. It's like they borrow and share. I want to ask the Honorable Minister if he will, who holds them accountable? How, how do we hold them accountable? If the Honorable will, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Ifani, joining us from Indonesia. Ifani, let's hear from you. Yeah, thank you, sir, for the wonderful opportunity. And also, I want to thank the Honorable Minister for the wonderful speech and the work he has already done to help Nigerians, and Nigeria youth especially, and the future of Nigeria. You know, this is, the, for me, this is the kind of people we, we, we need to call heroes. Uh, and they will be alive to see the, the Nigeria they preach and the Nigeria they want to be, Nigeria to become a better place in the future. What I want to say is that what uh, uh, these people, this our government, they are running is normal digital slavery. And uh, I, I, I pray to God, God to help Nigerians with what these people are doing. And so I want to pass a little message to you because I know you have the opportunity to, to this message to get those our politicians that in the future, the future they may, they may have two people in security men, two key soldiers. In the future, time will come. We, the youth, will come to their house. Even though they have 50 policemen, we are going to be 1,000 to make sure they pay. So, so putting the life of Nigerian youth, putting the life of our children, great great grandchildren, to selling their future with this kind of what they are doing. Sir, please, I beg you in the name of God, you should try to pass this message that one day we come, the reckoning day we come, one, every day is for the thief, one day is for the owner. That to the Nigeria youth will come to them, they will not be in power forever. And when time will come, karma will come upon them. And sir, what I want to say again, continue to doing the good work. We are seeing everything and we know that God will protect you and to make sure that you will see the good future of Nigeria, all of us. We switching for let them go and check many nigerians are coming back soon nigeria will be unbearable from these politicians who is slavery our people and the, and the, and our grandchildren and so time will come they will pay heavily for that thank you sir and i pray that one day nigeria will be a better place all right thank you very yeah. much uh ifani and uh, from the u.s also abuchi oi abuchi thank you very much for the have some donation to the program we appreciate you for that and uh, we love you uh this uh, we can call this one breaking news this is breaking news from abu Choi for the handsome donation to symphony and uh, abu Chi has a, a word here he says excellent program thanks for bringing in the former sports minister man of integrity sad we don't have more people like him do you think nigeria being in oxygen is intentional or due to lack of knowledge and leadership? That's the question from Abuchi. Abuchi, once again, thank you very much. We appreciate you for that handsome donation. All right, Engineer Femi, let's hear from you. Yes, I greet you. I greet the thank house. You very much. Thank you. Um, our Honourable Minister, I greet you as well, and um, James and the rest. Thank you very much. Um, you know, Nigeria is at a precipice. And it's fundamental that we begin to look at anything we can glean, especially from your experience in the past and the things you have done and said, and begin to advise on how we can drive these things further so that anybody coming into rule will understand that these people have a standard and if you don't you're not meeting up there must be something we can do to to to, to sweep we move the carpet off your feet we don't have that time anymore you know 
Nigeria is a country where the lies that anybody can tell, the limit to the lies that they can tell you, it's un unprecedented. Now, you hear a huge vessel of tanker is missing a country where we don't have any other means of getting revenue, foreign exchange. The only point, the only part that we have, and they were not serious about it. Um, naval officer come, says one thing. Kiari came, says another thing. Custom came, say another thing. You begin to wonder if it's the same country. And yet you have a commander-in-chief. Um, as an engineer, I've been able to work in the creek with um, Total. Okay, till tomorrow, the least um, production we do there is close to 2 point something barrel per liters. They tell you what you see here ends here, don't say it out. But it has come to that point where the things you keep not saying is destroying the country. Guess what will happen to this? Nothing, no one will be held culpable. In other clans, you would have heard that the Minister of State would have been sacked. The President would have resigned his position as the patrol head because he's not working properly. Um, you also see a case Angola made in six months, January to June, $11.9 billion as revenue from oil alone. How much did it make? We increased our borrowing instead by... This Ukraine war, South Africa with their coal signed contract of $6.9 billion and they are making money. How much revenue are we making? Do you know we don't have any idea? And then we have a National Assembly that is just rubber stamp. One, we don't know how much we consume, and it is easy to know. It's not like these things come in flies. They come in huge tankers. Is it not possible to know the amount of tankers you are paying for and where they are going to? We keep lying to ourselves, and that's the worst part. It's not, it's not a problem to borrow. It's when you borrow, where do you take it? Where don't you, are you doing with it? You give us lip service, infrastructure, infrastructure. Where are the infrastructures? Farmers are complaining. They can't go to farm. They can't come from the road. The rails are not working. Um, doctors are threatening to go on strike. The air, the, uh, the our airlines are shutting down and opening like you know, like um, like you don't care. And then you ask in all of this thing, in all of this, as Susan and all, where is Mr. President? Where is Mr. President? When is he going to address us? Even in Ukraine. In the midst of the war, the, the president is still taking position and addressing the country and talking to the world in the midst of a huge war with Russia. And then that is a president for you. You can see his age selling for him. You can see him moving to places, even to, 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 to where they exported um, 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 this thing from their country. And my own, we sit back. You want to do a world class railway, it's the only one that you do for Niger. Kanu to Niger, world class. The other ones are um, a, just a little better than locomotive that he did all over the country. Now, Maybe my class. Brother, our yes. So my problem is, what is the direction? What is? Do you know the country is moving without a vision or a direction? If I ask everybody that is talking now, what do you think is the plan or vision of this country right now? We will say. 10 different things because nobody knows. Nobody knows. To live like this insecurity, we've given up the whole of our forest to the bandits and them terrorists. You know, they started as full and headsmen. But if you don't call them terrorists, don't call them full and you, you are profiling them. We left profiling them now. Since these guys, are, how many, how many head, headers have come out to cry that terrorists have taken them? Meanwhile, they all move in the forest, they never meet. They go parallel. How many times have you heard that cows have been taken? You won't hear it anymore now because the name has transcended all of this. My brother, it is a sad tale that we still have Minister of Interior when Kujie Prison is one of almost 15 that has been broken and we have more dangerous people out than we have in the prison. 
and yet the man is still gallivanting. No, it looks like nobody pays for any crime, you know, and that is why you can hear that 100 or something billion for one man was taken out of the account and so at what point are there going to be consequences you look at what happened to magu magu had serious cases he was prosecuting guess what they took him off it they said for flimsy excuses presidential panel have been said oh, where is the report where is the report let me just come that. So that, uh, thank you very much so that the other thank you. can respond Thank you very much. You can respond uh, to this is uh, quite a, a number, a mouthful, but not a handful any longer. Well, thank you very much. Let me commend those who have uh, been able to <clears throat> join us and ask questions. And to commend our brother who has um, donated for the progress of this program. Um, for James, let me appeal to you that uh, we don't have any other country except Nigeria. If you listen to experiences of some people, maybe if I relate my own experience to you about Nigeria, you will pack your things and come back to Nigeria. But I'm sitting here. So I don't think that because you travel and have accident in a car and maybe life is lost, then the people should be conveyed on the, our heads to the mortuary. No. We still use the same vehicle to carry them. We drive the same vehicle to carry them to their graves. You see, um, this country cannot be forsaken and abandoned by patriots. Because it will amount to patriots surrendering to evil, evil people, which I am not willing to do it. I had an opportunity to study in Cambridge on a scholarship and a job, but I turned it down. I would have been a professor in Cambridge. But I love this country. And I know that Nigerians have not offended me. It's the leaders of Nigeria. So I cannot forsake Nigerians because of Nigerian leadership. I will not. I told the professor, the dean of the School of International Relations in Cambridge, that I was declining the offer of a job a scholarship job to go to Cambridge. And he said, why? And I said, what will I learn in the UK? And he looked at me and said, this is the first time he's seeing an African rejecting an offer. And I told him, look, all you've seen in me is that maybe there are potentials which you want to exploit. So you give me a job to go to Cambridge, give me a white woman to marry, give me accommodation, and I become a Nigerian, a British Nigerian. Full stop. When you exploit what you want to exploit in me, in knowledge, I may be sent back to come to Nigeria. So, I'm not going. And I turn it down. When I left the university, I applied for Chevening Scholarship. I was the best. But I was declined offer because I graduated with a 2-2. I graduated with a 2-1, but the faculty of law in University of Georgia sat down and rationalized, and I became a victim. So I lost that chance, the Commonwealth Scholarship. So I think we cannot abandon this country because we have a gang of non-Nigerians because most of the leaders of Nigeria are not Nigerians. Their houses are in Dubai. They have houses in UK. They have houses in US. The whole meetings in UK, the whole political meetings in London, they hold it in Dubai. If they lose election, they go back to Dubai. Another election cycle, they come. How can I abandon my country for such people? 
How will I abandon my people to continue to be traumatized and suffer in the hands of these people? We will remain here. We will struggle down with them until we get them out of this place. Until the people listen to what we are saying and understand that what we are saying is right, we will not move anywhere. It doesn't mean that I don't travel out of the country. I travel out. But I can't relocate and leave this country because a bad president is sharing the money of Nigeria. So I'll run away and leave him. What has been stolen in Nigeria is not up to 10% of the wealth of this country. So we cannot abandon this to them and their children. Every weekend, they are going to London to Dubai for the graduation of their children. So what I understood with the attitude of these urban gorillas, as I call them, is they are busy preparing their children, giving them good education to come back and take over this country, while Nigerians and their children continue to remain slaves under the fangs of this evil leadership. So, James, you cannot wish Nigeria bad. I appeal to you to have everything. Wish Nigeria well and give your contribution like you are giving now. This country will be better. How do we hold people responsible? Well, it is only by electing a credible and responsible government that will come and hold people responsible. But you cannot expect an armed robber as a chairman of an armed robbery tribunal to convict armed robbers and sentence them to death. No. There is nobody to hold anybody to account as far as this country is concerned. And with the knowledge I have of this government, there is nobody that can hold anybody to account. All that you can see happening is that if there is anybody, if they now they are fighting over stolen money, the one that has outsmarted the other can use the police or EFCC to arrest the other one or go to the president and then get the boys around the president to write letter and say he has been sacked. The president might not even know. Just like they removed Magu. The president is not in the full knowledge of how Magu was removed. Magu was removed by the attorney, the accountant, or the attorney general. Because he wants to be a governor in KB. And he knew that the only person who can take him up will be Magu. If Magu was confirmed, Magu would have outlived this government. Meaning that Magu, as EFCC chairman, would have been able to hold every member of this government, including myself, accountable. So it was because of that fear that they eliminated him and brought this young man. Now, the young man is pretending to be very active, but it is guided activeness because he is being used to go after those who constitute obstacles to the looting that is going on. He's not prosecuting looters, no. He's pro prosecuting those who are obstacle to looters. That's what he's doing. So, that nobody will hold anybody accountable, except maybe in 2023, if Nigerians freed themselves from prison and elect a leader who will come back and begin to ask questions and then invite us who serve in this government to come and answer questions. Because I am ready any day, any time. Even if I will be shot. Those are people who are shot in other places. Because of the role I played in the government, I am willing. If we can die for Nigeria to make progress, why not? If we must go and answer for our wrongdoing and the, the consequences, the penalty, why not? But if you are talking about this government now, I don't see anybody holding anybody to account. Maybe another government. Now, a day of reckoning, just like the young man said, Joe Gerba in 1986 at a public lecture in Joe said, I am warning the political elite who have abandoned education 
in Nigeria. And we are sending our children to study outside the country. He said a time will come. Ignorance will be like an ocean, while knowledge will be an island. And they will overrun our children. Now, what Jogerba was saying was that if we keep shutting down universities and embarking on nonsense conversation, blaming those who are supposed not to blame, and while we are not talking about the weekly graduation of children, of governors, of members of House of Assembly, of ministers, of the president, weekly in Western universities, in European universities, a time will come when ignorance will be like an ocean, where knowledge will be an island and it will be swept by the ocean. So that day of reckoning is what you are referring to. That is, a day is going to come in this country. If you are holding an iPhone like this, you will be killed. Nigerians are going to measure those who are responsible for their predicament by whatever they possess. So we should be careful with what we are doing. Ensas has signaled and set the agenda of what will happen. Ignorant Nigerians, poor Nigerians, hungry Nigerians are 98% of the population of this country. And when they will have nothing to eat again, they are going to be run out like uh, uh, lions escaping from the their cages, and it's going to be a very serious problem. So, every average Nigerian is aware, including these people who are even looting, looting what they even don't need. They know. That's why they don't go to bed early. They sleep as late as 1, 2, 3 a.m. to be sure that there is quiet everywhere before they go to bed. So, they are fulfilling what Abraham Lincoln said. If the poor are not asleep because they are hungry, the rich cannot sleep because the poor are not asleep. Then uh, the, the, the question, Nigeria is on oxygen. Is it a conspiracy? Is it deliberate? Is a complete conspiracy of a reckless political class that found a docile political community. This recklessness you see being perpetrated in Nigeria is because of the very docile nature of the Nigerian political community. A very religious community that is very, very ungodly. So, the Marxist theory of religion being the opium of the people, that is what is being used now. A criminal in Nigeria has religion and has strife. So if you arrest one, those who belong to that religion will say, oh, because it is, he is a Christian, that's why the Muslims went against him. If he's a Muslim, the Muslims will say, Allah Akbar, you have gotten him because he's a Muslim. If religion is not to play, they will use ethnicity. Oh, he's South Aflani, oh, he's Yoruba, he's, and then... People are mobilized using this primordial sentiment as a cover-up. I've never seen a very docile community like Nigeria in the whole world. What is happening in Nigeria cannot happen in nearby Niger. In Niger, a policeman slapped a woman. The whole market was folded up. Just slapping a woman. But look at what is happening. A man stole 1.9 billion and he went to the court and sat down and he, he sat down so majestic and looking at the judges and he was laughing and he got bail. You couldn't have taken him to prison because he will buy the whole prison. If you take him to a correctional facility, he will buy everybody there. He has 1.9 billion in one transaction. Other transactions have not been discovered. 
a man who was a, 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 a director general of NDDC who was accused of spending 81 billion in three months during COVID went to the National Assembly and when he couldn't answer questions, he dramatized and the drama brought an end to 81 billion. Till today, you are not hearing anything. Magu's case, what of the petroleum products that Jonathan's government imported to China and we came in which was sold at seven billion dollars and it was alleged that Magu Attorney General let Abakari and one other the, 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 the DG of the Nigerian spy organization were involved in maybe appropriating that funds to their pockets or to maybe the agencies. No clear definition. Nothing heard about it. So, the issue of what is happening is a deliberate conspiracy of a fortunate, evil political elite that found a docile political community. And so they are just milking the people. It's only God that will save Nigerians. And then the last thing is, what is the vision of Nigeria? The vision of Nigeria is still the vision of our founding fathers who went to Lancaster House in 1954 and agreed that Nigeria is a plural and a multicultural society, very diverse, blessed with resources, and that we should form a federation where every segment of a federating unit will control the resources, form a government based on its popularity, and send in its contribution to the national coffers. Nigeria cannot effectively succeed on this federal system. This federal system that we are practicing was not what was agreed in Lancaster House. And anything in this country short of that agreement will take us to nowhere because we are forgetting our history. It was the breakdown of this type of federation with the save rule motion in 1953 that led to Lancaster House. And for history students, because in 2004 or so, or 2004 or seven, I think, when they were, when they just celebrated the centenary, because I don't believe in the centenary. Nigeria, 2014, Nigeria was amalgamated in 1914. It collapsed in 1953. From 1953 to 1954, there was no central government in Nigeria, and there was no Nigeria. This Nigeria we are talking about was created in Lancaster House in 1954 under the leadership of Lord Littleton. But this amalgamation collapsed. Because the self rule motion in 1953 led to the attack of northern leaders in Lagos. When they left and came to the north, they said, We are no more going again. And they refused. We are not going. That's the end. The British persuaded them, they said, No. The British went to the southern leaders and told the world, can you place a delegation and go to the north and appeal and persuade your brothers to come to the center? They went to the north. After addressing northern leaders in Kano, they were beaten. So when they came to the south, they said, we are no more going. So from 1953 to 1954, there was no Nigeria. Amalgamation of Luluga collapsed in 1953. So when I hear people sit down saying, oh, we celebrate the centenary. Centenary of what? 
This current Nigeria suddenly not to be black at all. And when the military overthrew it and introduced this unitary system of government where they appropriated all the deliberation of Lancaster House to the center and created a monster in the name of a presidential system which they claim is in accordance with the American system. But all the elements and the components are not the same. In America, there are county police, there are even village police. Do we have the same here? So which the American system will practice? All right, Nebu Mr. Let's take OB or G. OB just joined us from the US. So that will be uh, three minutes for you to uh, do your opening speech so that we can go to the progress on the program. Let's see you, OB. Okay, honorable, good evening, and uh, good evening, uh, Victor. Uh, before, please, Victor, before... Oh, ben, oh, ben, no, how are you? Good. Before, Victor, you proceed to the main event today, I would like him to answer these questions. Uh, one, since he knows all these things, I'm even sharing this, all these things he's saying. It's embarrassing to hear. I'm listening to this thing with some of my American friends here. And they will be like, damn. So... I would like him to give us, why, why don't you tell us the solution to all this looting? And since he's the former, uh, former uh, 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 minister of sports, I believe on his watch, in, uh, on NFA, NFA, Nigeria Football Association or whatever, they were looting money, which I saw that there is a lot of evidence showing that even to the extent of faking like there is a match that is played in Cross River where uh, FIFA gave Nigerian TNF a, a, a huge amount of dollars and they stole that money and looted it. I don't know if it happened on his watch. And uh, uh, I think uh, Celeste Mbabayaro and Kujamidu was the one leading to make sure that those people that loot all those money for years in NFA got to justice. But up to now, nothing has happened. And uh, also, since he's the uh, former minister of uh, sports, I think he has good heart for Nigeria, for him to come to the program and be lamenting all these kind of things. And what he said to the other day, I saw a uh, stumble, him making a speech on a conference about ASU, which uh, one of our uh, person have reported there, what has he has to say on the embarrassment of our athletics that went to the last few months ago uh, competi competition that was happening in uh, Atlanta, sleeping on the floor in the airport. The other time, I think during the time they went to match in Brazil, uh, our uh, players were kicked out of hotel because they weren't paid, or there is no bus flight. They were stopped over. There was no connecting flight because they didn't pay. Uh, somebody have to bring a private plane to come and pick them. What kind of embarrassment is this? I don't know if that's when you are in charge. If you know all this problem, can you tell us two solution how we're going to solve this thing? Because we want to change Nigeria and we want to move forward. Because if you keep on talking about what happened in Nigeria, today will be gone. And still, we all know there's a lot of corruption and looting. Please, answer the question. Thank you. Right. Obi, I, I didn't want to go to sports, because that one should ordinarily be a full program of his own. Because if uh, the Honorable Minister start, start talking about sports, I, I want to, I don't know. Maybe the Honorable Minister. Don't give us solution and don't have just, you know, he, he asked a question about yes. the corruption in sports. Yeah. 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 Let me let me correct the impression. The first person to petition corruption in sports and invited uh, EFCC and DSS to investigate sports is myself. Not uh, any former. Or no, no, and Magu investigated sports but refused to prosecute. Mm -hmm. So, when it was about the 
terminal desk of my living office. I told myself that if I don't pick up this issue and leave office, they will turn it against me. So I wrote the president, informing him that I reported a case of corruption which was investigated by Magu, but Magu refused to give me a report of his investigation. So when I wrote the president and copied Magu, Magu now wrote a comprehensive report. I reported that three million US dollars was misappropriated. Magu in his report said, no, minister, you lied. My investigation revealed that 12 billion was stolen. But Magu could not prosecute any of the persons till today. Then there was a presidential tax force on recovery of uh, government, government money by Barisa Obla. So we took a copy to him. Obla investigated, took the report of Magu and charged NFF officials to court. The Attorney General of the Federation went there, when I left office, went there and rubbish the case. Withdrew the case that he was taking it to his office to prepare and charge very well. Nothing was done. Then one day we went to court and there was a drama that those persons who were charged to court, the court has not even taken their plea that they were discharged and acquitted. But I know time does not run against the state. Any day, any time. That report of Magu will be prosecuted one day by a government. So that day of reckoning, when it comes, that one will come up. About the embarrassment happening to our players, not only the Super Falconets that were embarrassed, you made reference to even uh, Atlanta when I was in office, that one too was more or less like an avoidable situation uh, which was mismanaged. When I came into office as a minister, uh, Nigeria was on recess, on recession, and uh, there was no fund. I borrowed 50 million from my friend to camp Team Nigeria for Rio 2016. The first funds released for Olympics was four days into Olympics after the opening ceremony. So if the government released money four days after the opening ceremony, will Nigeria be honest enough to expect medals? But because um, this was a situation, I had to take responsibilities, and my name was at the forefront of everything just to save the name of the country because an individual will have to sacrifice for his country. But that was what actually happened. The money that was used even to calm the entire team that ultimately even came back with one goal, one bronze in a, the, the, the football in men Olympics and nine gold medals in Paralympics was as a result of the money I borrowed. So, but we are in a country where efforts of people are not recognized. So that was what happened. The worst that even happened, which I thought you were going to reply, you didn't, was during my time, we were able to develop basketball that grew and made Nigeria proud. In 2018, they went to World, World Cup in Tenerife, France, Spain, and became the first country, African country, to qualify to quarterfinals in 100 years. And they moved their ranking from 32 in the world to number eight, beating basketball nations like Italy, Argentina, and Turkey. They became world uh, African leaders and they are African leaders. They qualified for World Cup again this year. And we woke up with the minister banning basketball. As a result of that ban, 
uh, FIBA took the qualification of Nigeria and gave number two, Mali. Mali. And after some times, for about a month or two, the minister came back again and said, I had a good dream now. I have decided to unban bas basketball. But we have these girls, whom majority of them were brought up in America and Europe. They were born there. In fact, I believe their parents told them that Nigeria is not worth dying for. But they said, no, we will correct this impression. They did their best, lifted their country, but their country forsaken them and abandoned them. And this World Cup that they lost is the peak of their career in basketball. So meaning Nigeria ruined the career of these young players, the, the Tigers and the Tigers. So we have a lot of embarrassing development. How I wish, how I wish this thing never happened when I'm still here hearing them. Looking at the effort we put in developing sports and to where we are today. So this shame that you have talked about, well, as leaders, we take responsibilities because uh, we can't exonerate ourselves. We're leaders. People expect us to do magic and do miracle. But uh, if we cannot do magic, perform magic and miracle, we will not fail to apologize to uh, Nigerians and uh, ask them to not to lose hope in the country and believe that there are people who love this country and will get out of it one day. All right, uh, let's go on a short break and then we'll just uh, delve into uh, continue the program. Let me put it that way. And our guest tonight is former Honorable Minister of Sports, Solomon Dalong. Uh, he's been my guest and uh, we have quite a number of persons who have joined us online. Let's go on a short break, very short one, and then we'll continue the program. We must have a country that we all believe in. If you look at the statement made by uh, leaders, especially at independence, because we had three major regions and later the Midwestern region, people were thinking more about their regions. So even now, people don't believe that Nigeria is their nation. In fact, people will tell you clearly that Nigeria is not a nation. Yes, we know that in terms of technical definition, but it is not only Nigeria that we have different nationalities coming together to form a country. Almost all the countries in Africa can say all. There's no country in Africa that you'll go. There's only one nationality that you'll see maybe in the Arab world, in South America, and so on. But others have been able to come together and have a country that all of them believe in. So what is holding Nigeria back? And until we believe that we have a country that no matter what you are, no matter how you worship, we have equal rights. Then we have nowhere to go. When I was in office, there's some challenges, information that got to me, and I got worried. Some parts of southern Nigeria, if a Muslim dies, to get a land to bury it used to be a problem. Some parts of the north, if a Christian group want to build a church, you cannot get land from the government. Some other person has to go and get land as a personal land before that person can donate to the church to build. And I set up a committee made up of governors that look, we must move away from this division to not lead the country anywhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, that came towards the tail end of the government and we couldn't go too far. But these are the things that worry us. A Nigerian must be proud of being a Nigerian no matter how you worship your God. Look at just West Africa. Go to all the countries in West Africa. There's no country that you don't have Muslims and Christians. Why is, that? Why is that that of Nigeria is different in different proportions? Nigeria in Africa, yes, have, countries have different problems, but in terms of religious, the, the crisis that religion is bringing to us, Nigeria's case is the worst in Africa. And we must cure that. The young people must cure that. And we must all consider Nigeria as our nation. T23, and uh, 
We've been looking at the state of the nation quite a myriad of Can we, Honorable Minister, for you, looking at all the things happening and then some of the things he said at the Kuka 70th birthday, do you share that concern? as an absolute political figure uh, holding grip on power and um, oppressing the majority that is not the situation the current APC government lacks the political willpower to even manage this transition they can't make this transition a government that does not have the willpower to provide security, how does how will he manage or midwife a, a transition? So when people say, "Oh, APC is trying to rig the election," APC is so disorganized that it cannot do anything for itself. The government is a rat race. Every minister is running. His ministry as a government, where would him as a sovereign? They only meet at the Federal Executive Council to share the money. And everybody takes it and does anything he wishes. You can, you can see the Minister of Humanitarian uh, Affairs or in Humanitarian Affairs, I don't know. And I will use better going to Bauchi to openly tell people that look, my husband is contesting an election and we can afford to play with over two billion. That's a minister of the Federal Republic. And coming back in a in, in a, a, a Air Force One of the federal government. So the money which is meant as an intervention is now being used for the campaign of her husband. To install a husband in Bauchi. Ministers went and bought forms and con were contesting election, including the governor of the Central Bank, who is an APC member now. There is nowhere in the world this can happen. They were using their offices to campaign. When the president suddenly realized, because one of them resigned, and it's because of the resignation of that one that opened up the kanka worms. The president gave them three days for everybody who bought from to resign. That was a presidential direction. Every other member of the cabinet who bought from by that statement ceases to be a member of the cabinet. All that is expected from him or her was a letter of resignation. In all the ministers that bought forms from 100 million from 50 to contest governorship and senate came back and said, oh, we have become born again nationalists. We will remain with the president till the end of the chinua. There was nothing left for them again. The president has sent them back in. But they came back again and are still there. Those that resigned, resigned and left. The irony of this government was that a minister who resigned 
still went to the cabinet, sat in the meeting of the Federal Executive Council, debated, participated in all the proceedings. It was at the end of the meeting that he told the president, I want to use the opportunity to thank you. From the day he tendered his resignation, he ceased to be a member of the Federal Executive Council. So he can only be admitted with the leave of the president into the council to give or to move his vote of thanks. But he went and said, that is the type of government we're dealing with. And there was no any sane human being who observed this to the president. While I was a minister, you know, James said, why was I not saying this? Uh, James has just been unfair. If you are within the system, you tackle the system using the channel of communication from within. And I never allow anything to pass without challenging. I never. For the whole period I was in cabinet, I never allow anything. There was a time EFCC and DSS were trigger drawn in a Sokoro against each other for three days. The president didn't know. We went for Federal Executive Council meeting. I thought it was going to be the issue on the front border. It was not mentioned. During AOB, I put up my hand and sought the leave of the president and he, he granted. And I asked him whether he was aware that as we were talking, EFCC and DSS were triggered on against me for three days. And he asked me, what were you saying? Then I realized that the president was not aware. And I took my time to explain what happened. The president was very angry. We closed that day even without any formal uh, closure. Immediately he left. The trigger drone situation was dismantled. So this dictatorship we are talking about, let us not exaggerate the issue of dictatorship and create a monster out of nothing. APC is not a political party. APC is a group of people with individual grievances, but with a common enemy. So when they eliminated their common enemy in 2015, they started fighting themselves. That was why the president was inaugurated on the 29th of May. On the 2nd of June, there was fighting in the National Assembly. And there was war throughout our period for four years. As a minister, there was no year budget was ever passed earlier than five months. I didn't see 2019 budget implementation. I didn't see it. Because the implementation came when I left in August. It took seven years for the National Assembly, to, seven months to approve the budget. In 2018, it was about five months. The same thing in 2017 and 2015. For the whole four years I was in cabinet, the overhead uh, of running the ministry, which is released monthly, there was no year we had six months in a year. The highest was five months. So, that was the situation. So, even if you are talking about dictatorship, you are you are just over glorifying incompetence and cluelessness. My fear is that APC does not have the political will to midwife a transition. And in if in event of anything happening wrong, we are going to have a political statement. Mention one person in the government that can come up now and muster the, 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 the political willpower to save their country. Mention the person. And I will run down his profile for you. That's not. So Nigeria is like a ship that the captains, the, the, the captain has died of heart attack and nobody is aware 
So the ship is just navigating on a very turbulent wave going. All the passengers on board are not aware that, oh, the captain is not there again. He's not in control. They're not aware. We are governed by a group of small, small boys. Majority of them have never seen government fire. They're the ones who took over. And they seal the place. You can't see the president. However well intended, you can't see the president. And unfortunately, leaders of this country are not doing anything. Why would the former leaders of this country, they are alive, they can't come together to talk about this thing? When has this happened? The country, the president does not address the country. They are killing people. They are kidnapping people. But it has even attacked the brigade of guards. They have attacked the convoy of the president. No statement. The only person that talked to Nigerians, uh, special advisors or senior special assistant, whatever the uh, nomenclature, or oh, uh, special assistant on social media, they are the ones who are tweeting, even tweeting on policy issues that is related to the powers of the commander in chief. We, we, we're, we're not quiet here. We're, we're not asking questions. Jonathan never had this privilege. Leaders came and mobilized, demonstrated, and forced Jonathan to sit up. Reckless and overambitious, clueless, inexperienced young people had held the country on his jugular. Nobody's saying anything. This ship, if leaders and elders of this country do not come together to save it, it will capsize. All right, uh, gentlemen, we just after we are now there at the business end of the program. Uh, I am sorry, I will have to take uh, 90 seconds from every one of us. I'm sorry, do please pardon me except uh, maybe you will now ask us uh, to do the program for three hours. <laughs> so please, I will be taking just one minute, 30 seconds. Sin Jabam has joined us from the UK. You have not spoken. Let me give you two minutes. I'm counting. So once it's two minutes, I will ask you to give up. All right, Saint Jabam. I might not need as much as two minutes. Good evening, Sir Victor. Okay. Thank I just you want to much. commend. I've, I've been at the background just listening to what um, the former Honorable Minister of Sport is saying. And uh, one thing I have known about in regards to one of the questions he was asked, why didn't he say so much while he was in government? One thing I've come to understand about the Buhari's government is if you say something, you will definitely go out. It might not be immediately in the nearest future. So I think maybe that was one of the reasons that might have relieved him of the appointment or re not reappointing him after the 2019 <laughs> presidential election. So he might have said some things which we are not comfortable to the power that be. That was that might be, I don't know how, if he said he actually said things because I didn't hear of things he said compared to the likes of um, Ita and uh, compared to the likes of um, Ibe Kachuku who actually came out and said things, and we know how they ended up by the end of the 2019 election. So I just want to commend him for what, he, what he's saying, especially for the ASU matter, which he actually spoke up about. It is actually commendable for a former minister to, to actually know the issues. That means those who are in office, they actually know the issues, but they, don't, they are just trying away from the issues. They're trying to blackmail the association in, into, false, into false claim. So I just want to commend him so that more people, moreover, most of the things he's saying, these are actually from his own side. There are so much more that will be said, especially this is just for between the 2015 to 2019. There's so much more to be unraveled between 2019 and 2023. So let's just sit back and continue to observe until then. <laughs> Thank you very much for the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senjabam. James? 
let's hear from you, James. Like yeah, I, said, I, must, I, must begin, I must begin by apologizing to the gentleman because I really don't know much of him. That's why I made the statement. But what he has said is very frightening. Uh, please, uh, can, Mr. Victor, can you tell him I owe him an unqualified apology? Yes. No, I'm listening what, to you. Thank you, okay. my brother. Okay, you've done what Napoleon could not do for France by coming here today. Uh, I don't want to take much time. Thank you so much indeed. You're welcome. Thank, thank you very much, James. Polly Wunze, let's hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Victor. And uh, once again, thank you, Honorable Minister. I mean, uh, uh, wow, wow. I just I have to say wow. Um, Honorable, but uh, what, what I will say is like an appeal. That's what I want to do now to you. I don't know your party affiliation. You know, uh, you answered my question uh, excellently well. And uh, in that question, you gave us the solution to our problems. And uh, that is the solution. It's 2023. Um, uh, the next election, that is the solution to our country. I don't know your party affiliation, but uh, I want to appeal to join the movement that will change Nigeria, because that is what every min everywhere meaning Nigeria is doing now. To so join the movement that will change Nigeria uh, is an appeal to you. Um, and they employ most of your friends, some political elite, to join that movement. And that movement, you, uh, Honorable, I will say, you know where the will, where the support of Nigerians, less the youth, especially the youth, where their will is. Their will is with Labour Party, P2B, and the Dr. Uh, Dati Ahmed. That is the will of Nigerians. That is our will. That is what we want now. At least I'm appealing to join that movement. If you love, because I, I, I'm seeing now from what you said now, Everything you said, you love Nigeria, and you want Nigeria to do well. I don't care the past. But what I'm, what I'm interested in now is the present. What you have said now, you care, and you want Nigeria to do well. Please join the movement to change the course of Nigeria. Thank you, Honorable Minister, and I want. I'm looking forward to seeing you back with us. Please, thank you so much. May God bless you. We've not, we've not talked politics. <laughs> Ifani, let's hear from you, Ifani. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, the Honorable Minister. We really appreciate you with the Nigerians youth. You are, you are really Goodbye, doing yeah, a very, we are, you are really doing a good job. And uh, you are one of our heroes. And you we will never forget you. Because time will come, your name will be also be written as those who, who stand to make sure that Nigeria become a better place. That is what we pray for. And uh, I want to also say that, my brother, not everybody is obedient, but also I want to appeal that Nigerians, those who want a better Nigerians, and those who want to liberate themselves from slavery, this digital slavery APC government has introduced, and even with PDP, they are introduced. Please support P2B so that you can able to you can able to let us end this slavery in 2023. Let us end this this criminals who who want to make sure that they enslave our generation upon our generation in the future so that we can able to have our country back to be the country where we can call home tomorrow to be the country where we can even have light have good things we are the country that other people cannot be ourselves to go to our home we can really could go to our home by ourselves thank you sir answer please to do still do more work and tell us to support this movement so that we can get the Nigeria of our right, dreams. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Obi, let's hear from you. Okay. Actually, like uh, they say, we don't know his uh, political affiliation. We all are joining hands together to welcome him on uh, Obi's movement at this moment. And I want him to go home and think about it. He is the kind of people that need to be in Obi's government and Obi's cabinet, because at least he see the bad thing and he speak out. Even if that Nigeria does not like, uh, no, not really Nigeria, the elite, that group of people that he mentioned, young boys, does not like the right 
thing for Nigeria. He is a patriot. And at the same time, uh, I, mean, I said this a couple of months ago on this program, if Kia is not taken, what Mr. James says, there might not be election. You will be surprised military will take over in Nigeria if Kia is not taken. Because what they are seeing now and what the elite are seeing in Nigeria from P2B have never happened in the in the history of Nigeria. So, and uh, they know how P2B is and his record, including you, the minister, is people like you that will help P2B change Nigeria. I understand you are shaking your head that is not possible. When a man has a gun, he has power. Even a small pistol of a gun, he has power. You cannot do nothing. So we don't pray for that. We know we already moved to democracy. But at the same time, what they are seeing now, nobody have ever seen, including you. You have not seen what you are seeing now in your life, in the history. I know I've been following Nigeria for a long period of time. Please, I appreciate how you answer my question, although uh, Victor don't want you to answer, but the way you clear yourself on the air, <laughs> I think everyone of us. I know, I know, I know why I said. I know why Bobby I said. Bam, 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 bam. I know why I said. I don't want him to go to sport. Now he cleared yes. everything, don't I you? Was, I, I see yeah, that you him yeah, enough time to explain because you are enjoying yeah. his explanation, including us. Everybody was enjoying his explanation. Maybe he has not have an opportunity to explain himself to this extent until now. Now he's out of his chest, and he will go home and sleep happily, knowing when he was a minister. He didn't do thank anything you wrong. Much, okay. okay, thank All you right. very much. I'd like to hear get you back here again. Okay, sure, sure. Okay. All right, Femi, let's hear you. Femi. Um, um is interested. Um I have been going. Can you hear me? Where Hello? would you, Femi? I hear you. I hear you. Can you hear me? Where would you? Okay. 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 Um, the honorable minister has said a lot. The country. I don't know where we'll start from. Mine is, we should start picking things from the ground, and see how we can draw ourselves together, and begin to put government, make government accountable for these things. There are lots of complaints we can complain from now till tomorrow. It's just that the more you complain, the more the things begin to continue. And then that's the frustration that we're facing every other time. It is quite sad. It is really... Right. Because it's really terrible to think about it. Thank you. All right. Chris, thank you very much. Chris George is joining us from Ecuador. Chris, ordinarily, you would have just said uh, good night, but I know you want to say something, but I'll give you 60 seconds because uh, Honorable Minister has to wrap up. 60 seconds, Chris. Good to have you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm just coming now. Uh, what I want Sorry. to say at the moment in Nigeria is change because uh, Nigeria government that has to. Chris, sorry, it looks as if, uh, see, okay, Chris, sorry. All right, Chris, so sincerely apologize. I uh, don't know why. Your line is really very good. Honorable Minister, you are parting shots as we wrap up today. Of course, uh, you will see by, by popular demand, it's not me any longer, by popular demand, they want you to come back. We've not talked about your own political affiliation. I didn't want to go to sports because I know if we go there, uh, that's my stronghold, and you know that. So I know there will be so much to talk about. That's why I didn't want to go to sports. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, pretty soon, we intend to bring you back. Hopefully. Well, I let me... Sincerely thank those who have contributed and uh, uh, 
many of them have invited me to join the OB movement. Some were even quite uh, modest to seek to know my political affiliation. Well, I was a founding member of the All Progressive Congress. And uh, one of the arrowheads of Buare's success in 2015. A lone voice that started opposing Jonathan's government in 2009. Not because I hate him, but when the National Assembly evoked the so-called doctrine of necessity, which they did not have, and coronated him an acting president. I said the Constitution has been violated. So as a lawyer and a man who is based on principle, I took exception and I opposed that government because it was an illegality. If the National Assembly could coronate a president, they would welcome one day and appropriate a constitutional power that they do not have and they would declare me a, a, a Chadian or a, a Nigerian. So I opposed that and I campaigned seriously against the government of uh, President Jonathan. But at a point in time, an elder in the North invited me and advised me that, no, Jonathan is of the same age group with me. I should go and meet Jonathan and advise him. Because if I don't do that, a time will come where we will have a young person, either myself or any of my own that is the president of Nigeria and nemesis or the law of karma will play back. So I went and met the president discussed with President Jonathan, offered him constructive uh, uh, advice, and even appealed to him that I was ready to help him in places which I could help him. But that my fear is that if he fails as a young man, it is going to be used against young people and future generations. And he has no reason to fail. He must succeed so that youth should continue to rule this country. He was quite happy and excited, but surely have I left the state house. Some people came, advised him, and everything was thrown off, off the table. So I went back to my trenches again and picked up the campaign of making sure that the government is not elected. So I'm one of the persons that brought Buhari and I'm very, very close to the president. I mean, I'm very, very close to the president. So, but I have resigned and left the old progressive Congress and joined the Social Democratic Party. And my reason for res resigning from APC is that the party had disappointed Nigerians. It has failed Nigerians. We never fulfill any of the promises we made to Nigerians. And so, I, it was morally wrong for me to continue to promote deceit in APC. So I resigned my membership and I apologize to Nigerians for being part of the people that contributed in bringing them to this particular situation. And every time I was still appoint, I, I apologize to Nigerians because this was not what I had in mind. Now, let me come back to the Peter Obi issue. You see, um, Peter Obi, for me, good man, young person that could be a Nigerian president. But the same mistake we made with Buari is the same mistake the youth are making. We rallied around Buhari just because of integrity. Nobody was asking questions. Nobody was asking anything. We mystify him to a god. And then there was the Buhari hurricane. The Buhari hurricane brought all sorts of people and created a political zoo with snakes, reptiles, uh, lions, baboons, monkeys, antelopes. So those who won election in 2015 into the National Assembly, most of them did not even spend out to 50,000. They were all elected because of the Buhari hurricane. So the hurricane swept both scorpions, snakes, uh, antelopes, baboons, 
and then into a zoo. So the political zoo of APC gave birth to the current situation we found ourselves. The youth are making the same mistake. We are already mystifying Peter Obi. Nobody has engaged him. If I have knew Buhari the way I knew now what is happening, I would have engaged him. But you see the, 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 the power of charisma which was built around him. In fact, if you ask a question then, you were an enemy. We will, will go after you. It's the same mistake Nigerian young people are repeating. And the Buhari hurricane was powered by Nigerian youth through the social media. We are now creating another monster without engagement. Anybody who asks questions about Peter will be now. People will attack him. So the way we created Buhari monster, we are creating another monster again. So I, my, my, my appeal is that before we take on this uh, Peter Obi issue, which the youth are yearning for, there must be a constructive engagement. Somebody like me cannot support anybody without engaging him. But thank you for the offer. I will tell you, sorry, I have a presidential candidate, a young and a vibrant man too, who is the youngest presidential candidate we have in this cycle. His name is Prince Adewole Adebayo. He's a lawyer by training. You would have listened to him. If not, you will also have time to listen to him. We will also have admit at the presidential debate. But as we narrow down to these issues you suggested, definitely we are going to cross ranks. Because we are not going to go to this war with open fronts so that these people will now rob us blind again. So if we get to where we are narrowing down to settling down for what is good for Nigeria, I believe that the youth will dumb this euphoria of creating or mystifying uh, charisma and then will now create another monster that he will feel that he's a god. Because of Buhari, Buhari's integrity, he saw himself as above every Nigerian and there was nobody again except him. And look at where that has taken us to. Honorable Minister, thank you very much. Uh, sincerely, we are really out of time. But, uh, well, it's okay. Thanks to everyone who has been part of the show. OBOG from U.S., Paul Liwunze from U.S., Chris George from Ecuador, Ifani from Indonesia, Senjaban from the U.K., James from the Gambia, Femi from Abuja. I hope I've got Abuchi Oi. Thank you very much for that handsome donation to the Symphony family. We appreciate you very much, Abuchi, also from the U.S. And most importantly, Honorable Minister, thank you very much, my Minister of Sports, Solomon Dalong, who has been my guest. And like uh, most of you requested, we didn't talk politics today. Uh, maybe we'll talk politics next time. They have requested, Honorable Minister, that will bring you back so that we can talk politics. Many, now, talk many, politics. many times I'll be here for this great country of ours. Thank you very much. And for the team, I thank you guys for always making it to happen. I love you all. On behalf of the team, I am Victor E. Really thanking you for being part of the show. Wishing you a pleasant weekend. Stay out of trouble. I'll see you next week. God willing. God bless your But what happens when the trouble comes after you? Because if you stay <laughs> out of trouble and trouble comes after you, what do you do? Please advise properly. I will stay out of trouble too. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a pleasant night rest.